All right, we're back. We are game 2005 in the fall 2018 semester. That's game physics at George Brown. And today we're going to be talking about the first part of collision detection, um, which I find is the most interesting part for me, right? Um, so a lot of the code you're going to be seeing today is going to be, I want you to consider it pseudocode because we're going to work through the examples uh, in lab uh, with our STL templates that we're going to be working on, right? So, um, so bear with it. Um, I don't want you guys to feel that this is the way it's going to be. Um, but at the end of the day, we're just going to be talking about collision detection methods. So in a game, we've been talking about physics all semester, you know, kind of motion and this kind of stuff. And today is the first time we're talking about like literally detection. And we do two, two phases, right? One is collision detection and the other one is collision response, right? And the collision response is going to be using things like the physics, the um, uh, things like energy of a system, that we talked about last time and um, how we do energy transfer, right? Because that's what part of what we're doing is in physics, right? All right, so um, again, I think this is what, what's written here is right on, which is collision in your game. It's gotta be believable, somewhat realistic. And the reason why we say somewhat realistic is because the more realistic it is, the more cycles it takes from your can you guys see this from your computer? All right. So I want you to think of that. More accurate. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's worse. And the reason for this is because there go. the reason for this is because the more accurate, let's say, for example, I was running a 2D game. Okay. And I want to do per pixel collision. So pixel, pixel collision, right? So the challenge there is, is, um, Detecting, you know, a uh, pixel perfect collision is computationally expensive. It just is, right? It doesn't make any sense in many ways, especially if you have hundreds of objects on the screen. If you're doing like a some kind of, um, you know, rail shooter or some kind of crazy, you know, um, you know, have bullet hell shooter, it's nuts, right? To, to pixel perfect collision, and we'll talk about bullet hell shooters. There's issues with that as well, but in general, um, you've got two two objects. At the end of the day, they can't occupy the same space. And after they collide, what happens? Sometimes they just explode, right? So sometimes in our video games, you know, whatever that we, we kind of take care of, it. there is no response, just boom, they explode, particle system effects, bye-bye, right? And then there's nothing there. Um, but often what we have is, especially this is what we're talking about physics, we have some kind of response. We have a motion that is, that goes as much as possible with the laws of like Newtonian laws of physics, which is uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So that's the third law of, uh, or Newton's third law of, uh, of motion. And the reason for this is because you have energy transfer. So energy is transferred from one object barreling into another object at speed, usually. And a lot of this is because you've got this something called momentum that's going to be built up. And we're going to be talking about that next week. Today, it's first we're going to talk about collision uh, detection, and next week we're going to be talking about um, more physics around uh, energy transfer. And I'm going to start with this this week because I want you guys starting off with your SDL templates and getting to know how to put these together. I probably will post your assignment three, which is the final assignment at the end of the week sometime. I'd like to try and do that. I'm still having to bang out some facts around it just to make sure that it's balanced. It's going to be a group assignment again, so I'm not going to kill you guys with individual stuff. Um, and it will be a programming assignment. There will be some things I'll have to do. So I'll probably get you to do things like, uh, you know, detect collisions on different kinds of objects, right, in using SDL. So, for example, uh, sphere, sorry, circle and square. How do you do that, right? Circle and point, you know, line and point, those kind of things. But how do we do those things? And why would we care about doing that? And then uh, there'll be some questions, some theoretical questions in there. Like I always ask you some little things like, what would you do here? Um, the test will not be a test, probably multiple choice, true, false this time around. It'll probably get you guys to do something physically uh, with your SDL template. Um, that's my plan anyway. So we'll see how it goes. And the reason why I'm saying it's my plan is my plan is because this part has never been completed, right? Remember, uh, there was a strike last year when I was doing this part. So I'm still working on it. Okay. Um, yeah, let's continue. So 
sometimes what happens is we have a lot of um, a lot of stuff happening. Actually, the best way before I go to narrow phase and, and all this kind of stuff, let's talk about a real world scenario a little bit. So I have a 2D game, let's suppose, and um, I'm running something in in JavaScript or in C++ or whatever language you want, as an example. And let's see if I can bring something up that is, I've got some assets here. So let's let's look at some images. So for example, let's say I have this little game, right? And I'm just going to run this in, um, in my little uh, fireworks program. And I want to talk about this a little bit. And I, and I kind of go through this because you know, people have this um, idea that it's easy to do, but actually it can be quite complex. So let's suppose that I have my little plane. It's on the ocean. Let me just draw my plane here. And here's my ocean. Okay, my plane's flying on the ocean. And I have an island. Put that on there too. There's the island. And here's my cloud. Obviously, you've got some some interesting shapes uh, and stuff here. I'm going to zoom in so you guys can see this. So, yeah, so you got this plane and it's going on the ocean. The plane is going. And then let's say the game is, and this I made this game a million times by the way. This is my mail pilot uh, hello world kind of asset game. Okay, I make this game in every platform. I'll probably make it in SDL as well. And what it is is, is a, a way for me to get familiar with the, the platform that I'm making it. If I'm going to do it in P5 next time, I'm probably going to do a mail pilot game. I did it on iOS and Android and blah, blah, blah. Um, and the reason for this is I, I think Hello World uh, programs, whatever they are, and I call them Hello World programs because that's what they are. Like, let's say you wanted to do a list to learn about database. You want to do uh, you know, a little game like this to learn about the you know stuff. And once you've done the game, or uh, whatever the Hello World program is, then you're a little bit more familiar with that platform. All right, so I recommend you put those in your back pocket and you use them over and over again, just like I'm, I'm doing right now. It helps me. So this is one of the games, and I have this little uh, game where uh, you have a point's not supposed to go. Uh, let's put these down here. So yeah, so the plane, um, you know, it's just running around, and then it once it goes over the island. You get points because the game is the game is called Mail Pilot, right? And the plane picks up mail from an island, and when it picks up mail from the island, boom, boom you get some points. Yay! Interesting game. Um, and then if it runs into a cloud, as an example, the cloud is angry and it has a lot of you know death in the cloud. There's some bad things that happen in the cloud. So when the cloud hits you, you you know you go, and you you get you get some damage. All right. I'm, I'm literally telling you this is how it is, right? And you might think this is actually easy, but here's the challenge, all right? How about collision detection between these things? I want to be able to detect the fact that I'm this island is coming down here like this. And meanwhile, the background is scrolling and stuff, right? Pretty simple. And I want to make a collision detection be between the plane and the island. Or how do I do that, right? So there's different methodologies I can use here. And if you look at the, um, the ways to do this, I only have a few objects, so I can, I can do it very easily. And let's say, for example, I'm, you know, checking every frame, you know, if the plane and the island and the cloud are colliding. Should I check here? Okay, I, I, I want to listen to your responses. I want, to, I want you guys to think about this for a second. So here I have the situation. I have a plane and a cloud, a plane and an island, and I have a response that said, should I check up here? And, and one person said no. Okay, how about someone else? Anyone else have an opinion around this? Sorry? My plane is where it is, way down here. So here's my plane down here. Should I check for collisions with these guys up here? How do you do that? What's what's the algorithm that you would make so that you check when it's closer to the bottom? Think about this. Code. So we're using a pixel base, right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter whether it's C plus or it could be in JavaScript or whatever. It doesn't matter. You make your coordinates based the way you like. So what would you do? How would you just think about this in terms of thing. Uh, you got this game, and one of the one of the questions is: Do you check collisions now? Okay, so your your answer is collision the whole way through. Okay, anyone else have any other solution? Yes. I would check the width of both objects and if they Which one? Which objects? Well, it would have to be both objects. These ones? 
Well, it's, it's easy to say, but what's the code? How to locate objects, right? So. I don't know. Tell me what you're going to do, right? So there's different methods, right? Uh, so one of the challenges is I have, you know, three objects. You know, who cares? I'm, I, even if I check every single frame for three objects, meh, no issues. But what if I have a situation where, you know, I have a few more islands, right? And this is happening. This is happening every frame. Come on. This is happening every frame, right? So I'm doing this. I'm checking all these islands, and they're floating around. And each one of these islands, I can get points on them. Um, and maybe, you know, do another cloud. Sure. Maybe there's another cloud coming down this way. You know, as an example, maybe it's floating this way down here. So I have to watch the clouds, you know. Now I got many more objects. And what if I have, I have bullets and I have a bunch of other stuff too, like enemies, you know, other objects on the, on the thing. So for three objects, you know, maybe we can think about it being okay. Check everything. But the challenge is um, when do I check and what's the, what, what's the performance uh, hit? What's, what's that going to do? So there's a couple of, there's a couple of uh, um, thoughts around this, okay? So one of them is, like you said, check every frame, okay? The other one is, don't check until they're close. How do you detect when they're close? You can have a check, like a boundary check. So for example, let's say in our code, I say something like this, right? And I'm trying to be visual here so we can understand uh, my thinking, uh, but not because of you know uh, any other reason. You can use this. So let's say this is a boundary, right? So, But I, I, this boundary I'm using is code. So I say, if the cloud or the island or whatever, anything enemies, uh, let's say the plane is restricted to being only down here, right? Uh, typical top scroller or whatever, right? And when the island uh, gets to this point right here or the cloud, then you start checking. What were you going to say? Right? Um, okay, so, you know, but you're now, but here's the, here's the thing. If the cloud, if the cloud, this happens every frame. Is the cloud there? Is the cloud there? Is the cloud there? Is the island here? Is the island here? I'm going to keep asking that question. I'm checking every frame. If, 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 if. I'm doing a branch every single frame either way, right? Because I'm checking. I'm checking to see if this happens, right? Um, and this is what... Uh, it it how? When? What's your if statement? What's your, what's your conditional statement? How are you going to make a check? That's the thing. It's, still a boundary it's either way you're going to do it, right? So uh, going back to what we were talking about is um, this idea of broad face collision. So what you're trying to do is, and, people, and Nick, you said the same thing, is uh, you know, don't do some kind of, uh, you know, don't check every frame. Do broad face uh, collision checking. So hey, am I within the area? And if I'm within the area, then start checking, right? Um, this is not a bad thing if, for example, you're using some kind of complicated, uh, you know, uh, method for checking collisions. If your collision check method is very complex, then you can actually shave down calculations by doing broad face collision first. Am I close? Am I close? Am I close? If, 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 if is probably easier than check, do some complicated square root calculations on, you know, the distance or something else. It's probably even more computationally expensive to do the real calculation than it is for you to do broad phase, right? The other some things sometimes we use something called the spatial hash, which I'm going to go into more detail next week, right? Um, almost like a awk tree, quad tree kind of thing, right? Uh, or what, what you do is you divide your, um, your screen in a number of sections until you have a, you know, some kind of detection algorithm, and it's usually recursive, right? So... You know, so there's, there's ways of doing stuff to kind of narrow down how close an object is before it collides with you, right? But again, let's go back to what we said earlier. What is good enough, right? Because at the end of the day, when you start doing collision detection, you can go really down a, a deep rabbit hole, right? What is good enough, right? The, the lower down you go, the more uh, computationally expensive it can become, okay? So you have to kind of balance what's the right uh, right method for collision detection. All right, uh, and then there's the idea of narrow phase. So you go from broad phase, you know, back down to narrow phase. And the idea is, again, if we go back to here, okay, so now they're here, now I start checking, now I start checking. This is the narrow phase. This is a very simplest form of doing so. I, 
when they, they come down here, then I can start checking. Otherwise, they're too far away, right? So does any, can anyone see any kind of uh, negative result or negative effect that this might have on your game? So think about what I just said. So I have, you know, I don't check collisions. I don't check collisions. I only check, I do the simple if statement or whatever, but I don't do the true collision checking algorithm until I get to butt here, right? So can anyone think about what can happen in your game or anything negative that could occur? Yeah. Well, I'm assuming based on the number of objects that would be a performance drop. If you're comparing 17 objects versus one. Right. So suddenly, you know, we have like, let's say, and this is not just, this is just a few objects still. Let's say you have a bullet hell shooter, right? But you don't check collisions until the bullets come really, really close to you, right? The rest of the bullets you ignore, right? So then you get this thing where everything is great. The performance is fantastic, but as soon as you ch start checking collision, it goes boom, and the, the, the whole game slows down to a crawl as you're checking for hundreds of collisions, especially particle system collisions or something crazy. So you get this weird, um, you know, uh, performance where it's inconsistent. It's fast performance and then it's slower performance. Yeah. However you do it, I like your thinking, but you're talking about broad phase and narrow phase again, right? Broad phase collision using one method, if there's an if statement or array, you're still checking something, right? So whenever you check something, it's just, you know, you're doing some kind of search uh, or a comparison or something, right? So depending on what, how you do it, this is just code, right? We can put a border and draw a line here. And even Unity does the same thing. Yeah, you want to draw a nice border bounding box. Well, what's happening in the background? Some kind of checks, some kind of if statements going on, about, some kind of branching statement. It's going to happen, right? Um, so the thing is, you know, so the question is this, and I'm asking you guys, right? In a 2D scenario, 2D only, right? What's better, inconsistent behavior, but accurate, uh, you know, simulation, or really bad all the time, right? <laughs> I, I personally like the really bad all the time thing, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll tell you why, right? I'd rather have uh, consistently bad behavior because it's consistent and I can improve the algorithm, right? As opposed to really good uh, performance and then really bad as I get close. And then really good when there's nothing close to me and really bad when it gets close, right? Because then I get some really, and I'm talking about extreme cases when there's like thousands of particles that are approaching you or something crazy like that. Normally, you wouldn't see this kind of behavior in a normal scenario, right? Most computers computers are fast enough now where you don't see it. However, what about uh, a mobile device, right? You're doing collision detection on a mobile device now. Uh, and yes, mobile devices are getting faster and faster, but they have the limitations we had back in the day when our computers weren't so fast anymore, right? Um, in the future, probably this is not even going to be an issue, okay? Like, as computers get faster and faster and have more cores and do multi-threading and all this kind of stuff, uh, more often, you know, whatever the, and the algorithms get a little bit more efficient. You're going to have, uh, this, this issue is not going to be a problem. You're going to do this broad face and narrow face stuff more often, but we're talking 2d here. What about 3d? All right. So 2d. Okay. Right. What about, let's bring up our little blender program. What about when you have a situation where, um, I have an object and then I have a bunch of other objects. Um, and they're way, way far away in the game world. Like we're talking about, you know, beyond the scope of, of, even, of even seeing. So let's say we have our little box and let's change this little box color. We'll use the diffuse uh, color to, and we'll take on the specularity right off. And this is our player, this is our player. Okay, here's our player cube, a player cube, yay. <laughs> and let's, uh, let's add in a, a couple of UV spheres. Yes, we'll have some UV spheres. And these UV spheres are way over here in the distance. And in fact, we'll uh, you know, add some more of them all over the place, right? And uh, you know, we'll put them all over the place in the game world, like over here, right? and over here, and maybe over here, right? Now what? <laughs> this is a totally different scenario, right? It's not the same, flat 2D plane with a lot of little, you know, a couple of objects, you know, going all over the place. Uh, well, okay, right? What about this? 
what about when these spheres are representative of particle systems that are moving towards your object? Not just one sphere, but lots of little particles, right? A particle swarm, um, a you know um, some kind of flocking behavior that you're going to have with a bunch of particles moving at the same time, keeping their separation distance and all this other stuff happening, and they're moving towards your your uh, player object, uh, you know that kind of stuff, right? I'm just saying, right? I mean, anything's possible. I'm just making a scenario up, but. What if this happens, right? So when do you start checking collisions? How do you do collision detection? So then when we get to the, this point, there's a lot of strategies that we're gonna talk about over the next couple of weeks. One of them is this idea of breaking up your, your whole world into a grid, right? Um, grid uh, detection algorithms are really efficient because the grid itself would know if there's any objects that you need detecting. So the grid knows, you know, more than the object itself, right? Which is something interesting. Uh, again, this idea of oct trees um, in uh, 3D as opposed to quad trees in 2D, right? So the idea of a tree algorithm is where you take, you know, your space and you divide it in half and quarter it, you know, kind of things. So you have like these four quadrants, you know? So I take my space here and I divide it in different, different pieces, right? And then, um, you know, and then I further divide it again. Do I have a collision in this quadrant? Yes. Is, are, is anything in near my quadrant? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. Detect collisions. And then cut, cut it up again. Cut it up again. Keep going. Yeah. But how would you guys think objects are in which quadrants? You'd have to do collision detection quadrants here where the objects Yes. But sometimes you also know you can, if you could divide it uh, when a, uh, there's ways of doing stuff like where you know, where the physical object is, you know, which which cell or tile or whatever. And furthermore, in 3D, you're not going to just do it on a 2D plane. You're also doing it with height and depth and uh, all this other stuff. So what about objects that are way above you, right, or way behind you or way below you? We can't think about, like, you know, uh, we're not two-dimensional thinking, right? Actually, I was reminded of this really interesting uh, video uh, back in the day. Uh, I'm a big Star Trek fan. But... Um, there's a, this this movie, old movie for you guys, 1982, Wrath of Khan, right? Uh, where, I don't know if it's a classic thing, Ricardo Montalban is the villain. He's Khan. And he's stolen, you know, a, a starship. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Spock says to Kirk, he says, Captain, you know, he says, uh, it seems that, you know, he is, it's something like, I'm trying to quote it per uh, perfectly, but I can't because it's, it's a it's a Tuesday morning near eight o'clock in the morning, and I and I have lost it this morning. But something like you know, you know, he's exhibiting two dimensional thinking, right? And then immediately Kirk says, "Fine, Z minus you know one thousand kilometers, right?" Which means that you know Khan was kind of thinking in two D because he came from another time where there wasn't he was a sailor, he wasn't a starship captain, and this idea of three dimensional thinking which also escapes us when we make stuff in 3D, right? We make stuff in 3D and then we're like, yeah, it's like 2D collisions. Wait a minute, what about the one behind me and the one below me and the one this one? And it screws you up. Um, it's easy to have Unity and Unreal do the calculations for you, okay? What if you're making from scratch? You're doing your own game engine. You're doing your own physics engine. Why would you do this thing? But let's suppose you did. Let's say plus, you, know, you had this idea of making your own or you're working on someone else's, you know, like you know, something else. And there is no collider. You're making it up yourself. What would you do? How would you collect, uh, you know, detect collisions? What if you were doing a simulation for some kind of military application or something? What would you do, right? I know you're laughing at me, but at the end of the day, you know, yes. You could do all kinds of stuff. Exactly. You can check less often. You can do whatever. However, if you check every second, you might miss your collision. It might pass through, right? Depends, right? Yeah. So I'm just giving you scenarios. I'm, I'm trying to get you guys to think because um, collision detections is, some parts of it haven't been solved, okay? Just letting you know. For example, the tunneling, tunneling effect of bullets. Hey, I'm just putting it out there, right? So I have this bullet and I'm just talking about it right now. I have this bullet, um, let's make an ellipse and see if I can make it even round today, this morning. Oh, it's too, too thick, too thick. It's crazy. It's a bomb, yes. And let's make, uh, give it some red in, inside. There we go. Yay. I did it this morning. All right. And so I'm moving this bullet around. It's actually a big bullet. Um, let's move this bullet so that it's it's far smaller. Okay. So this is the problem. All right. So there's my bullet, actually. It's like really, really small. Okay. And 
So my bullet's here and I have this bullet and it's going through, right? So imagine if, let's just get rid of some of this stuff just so that way you guys can see it more, uh, more uh, logically. Yeah, so I have this plane over here and dit, 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 I have this bullet. We're gonna detect the, you know, the bullet hitting the plane. And okay, so this bullet's moving very, very quickly. And let's say it's moving uh, 50 pixels per frame. 50 pixels per frame. So the, the bullet, the, the plane is here and it checks there, here in the first frame. And the next frame, it checks here. Right? Yes? Like a like you can put some hairs on the bullet? Is that what you're saying? Like hair? Like, like, like I don't know, you can make some... You could, you could do that. There's some stuff that I've seen those kind of uh, things before. Um, but now we're talking about a more complex object. Imagine if I have a thousand bullets, 10,000 bullets or something crazy in a bullet. I'm just saying it's becomes, it becomes a more difficult, complex problem. So what you're saying is take the collision box and make it like this, right? Sure, sure, sure. But then, you know, um, now you might detect a collision when there's none. For example, what if I move the plane around? Like, so, you know, it's going to get there next frame, but I'm here, right? And then I'm going like this. And then you would have, or maybe I'm here and it's going to hit me, but I'm gonna, not going to be there next frame, right? And so there's some complicated stuff. There can, you can do it. Uh, I like your thinking. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying it's just that, um, you know, and, and we're saying is extend the collision boundary so that it's beyond the, the actual boundary, the physical boundary of the bullet, and make sure that it's, it's way ahead. Uh, or whatever. And imagine if I had every bullet like that, almost I have a, like a little feeler in front of the bullet before I get there. And then I'm feeling if I'm if the bullet's actually close by, right? So uh, the wisdom that we talk about from uh, what is good enough uh, might be something like, don't make your bullet so small and slow them the hell down, right? The faster, smaller object is going to tunnel easier than a bigger, slower one. Faster, smaller is bad, right? Bigger, slower is good, right? And so you might think, but yeah, but that's not a challenge because it's bigger and slower. But then if you have thousands of them, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, and if you notice some of those older games, the bullets don't go that fast. They just like hang there on the screen and they kind of move towards the player and then there's collisions, right? Um, especially like these games where this, these graphics come from, right? I mean, you can see the bullets. There's bullet hell, but not that fast, right? The newer ones became faster because their calculations became better. But the idea of having a uh, some kind of extended boundary or a feeler, if you will, that's in front of the um, the object, uh, this is good, right? This is a good idea because what's happening is you're saying, okay, I'm gonna collide. I'm, I haven't collided yet, but in the next frame, I'm probably gonna collide and there's nothing that the plane is gonna be able to do, right? So mark that the, 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 the bullet's gonna collide. if my plane is physically not in that space so my plane is in this space so I, I keep track of where the plane is currently when my feeler hits it okay and i say if the plane is still physically there and my bullet has gone beyond it somewhere down here right as an example if the plane is still physically there then it's a collision right so you've marked the collision that's a complicated algorithm guys that's like keeping track of where the plane was keeping track of where your feeler is and the physical bounding box of the bullet and that's every single bullet Right? Uh, yeah, accurate, but so sometimes we kind of, we're okay with missing collisions. Just saying, all right? I'm saying if there's thousands of bullets, uh, you know, as an example, if you notice bullet hell shooters, the, the, colli the collision, the bounding box is just right around the cockpit. <laughs> they don't care about the plane itself. The cockpit is the main thing. If the cockpit doesn't have the collision, it's okay, right? Um, so that's this thing again. We're using we're using these basic primitive shapes, and again, I'm I'm using them for a reason because this is one of the methodologies we're going to be talking about here. So we talked about broad phase collision and narrow phase collision, and it, I think the names can kind of tell you what they are. But the idea is that okay, we're closer, start checking. We're farther, don't check yet. Don't do my complicated collision detection algorithm now. Wait till I get closer, right? For 2D and in a game like which, which one I'm showing you, don't I don't recommend it. I recommend consistently bad behavior, consistently bad. All right, if it's not too many objects, once you get into many many thousands of objects, as an example, you might want to do broad face and narrow face collision because then the 
uh, the it's going to outweigh if you start checking every frame, it's going to outweigh the bad performance. You're going to have really bad for really, really, really bad performance, unplayable performance if you check so many times with a complicated algorithm. And this is where you want some good performance at least way out there, and then some worst performance in the, in the middle. And, the, and if you're checking less objects as they come closer to you, then uh, it kind of outweighs. You kind of have to create this balance between one and the other. For the most part, uh, in a 2D scenario where there's not that many objects, I recommend not to do it, OK? If there's a lot of objects, do it. The more objects there are, then it, then it outweighs the bad things around it, like the inconsistent behavior that I talked about, right? Um, so a lot of times, but the most basic type of collision is this idea of a sphere, OK? So and, and again, I'm just reviewing stuff for people who don't know. So please forgive me if people know what this is. But this idea of a sphere. So I have uh, my plane in this case, and I have a sphere that defines its bounding box. OK, it's not a box, actually, but a sphere. Okay. And let's make the sphere transparent so we don't have to see it. There, that's the sphere of the box. We have our, our let's suppose we can see where the bounding box is for the bullet. Um, and the way we do it is, do the spheres touch? If the spheres touch somehow, if they intersect, um, you know, then we have a collision. Okay, but this is okay for this scenario, right? I'm just putting it out there. And, um, you know, if you look at it, the way we do the spheres is we have a radius for this sphere and we have a radius for this sphere. And we say, okay, if the distance between the middle of the plane and the middle of this object, the center of mass, is less than the, uh, the radius of both objects combined, you have a collision. Let's, let's do that again, because I think people don't really get that. I'm going to bring it up really, really close so you can see the ugliness of this whole thing in, 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 uh, in close-up pixelized form, OK? So again, I'm talking about radius. So I'm saying the radius of this thing. So I've got the radius of this, right? And i got a radius of here, this thing here. So there's two radii, right? And I'm saying that if I add the actual value of this radius and this radius together, right, I have a number, whatever that number is. Let's suppose my plane right, has a radius of, uh, of 30 uh, pixels. And my little bullet has a radius of 5. So it's 35 points, if you will, pixels. Now, what's the distance between these two things? So what's the distance between this and this, right? So we'll make another line here, and we'll make it a different color. Uh, we'll move the, let's see if I can move that. Yeah, we can do that. So I'm going to move this over here, and we'll make the line so that we'll, we'll draw the line a different color. And so that we won't have uh, the same color. So I'm going to check the. I'll be okay. Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. Okay, good. And we'll make the line a different color, like I said. Okay, good. <clears throat> there we go. So I have this distance. So this is my distance check. My distance check is, is part of the algorithm. So here's the algorithm get the radius of each object. I have to know the radius of each object. So I have a game object, I need to know its width. I need to know its half width, as an example, and half height or radius, however you want to say it, right? Depending on the sphere or the, the, the circle. I'm saying spheres because this could apply to 3D, right? Um, and what I do is then I check the distance. So what's the distance? Is the distance less than the radii combined, right? If it is, that means that they're intersecting somehow. If it's not, that means it's the scenario like this. Right, where they're, they're apart, right? This is the simplest algorithm. I'm telling you, it's worked for tons of games that I've made, um, and it's good because it's very simple. However, it's primitive, okay? And it's not 100% accurate. And you're gonna say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That means I still have a chance of the bullet passing through or something weird like that happening. You're right. Is it good enough? <laughs> That's where you have to go to. If it's good enough, stop, guys, okay? So <clears throat> I'm going to go with one more philosophy, OK, with you guys. So think about this. We're all programming as a group, all right? I, I marshal all of you. I, I separate you guys all. Some of you are artists. Some of you are programmers. Some of you are business people that do the, the design aspect, the mechanics of the game, um, you know, whatever. And some of you are researchers to see if this thing's uh, you know, going well. Some of you are play testers. And I put you all in a group and say, OK, make a game. You've got uh, an hour, go, right? And you guys are working on stuff or whatever. And you know, um, would you program? Would you um, refactor as you go, or would you refactor afterwards? What would your What would your methodology be for programming? 
I'm gonna ask some of the guys up in the back there because you know they're all quiet in the back and you're hiding, right? So anybody in the back in the back rows there, can you tell me what would you do? Yo, Jim, what would you do? I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna start calling people out now, right? Would you refactor as you go, so program as you go and change it and and, and make it nicer, or would you just do it rough and then do it and change it after? What would you do? Which one? There's two philosophies here, guys, and they're, um, they're, there's arguments for both sides. So <laughs> okay, that's the same. Uh, was that? As you go. Well, okay. So there you go. There's, there's two philosophies. What? So Yong Jim says, no, as I go, I'm going to make it better. Uh, Yong Ji, what would you think? You have two hours. You have one hour. You're on a time limit. There's no way that I would know. Right. Yeah. By the way, it doesn't matter if it's two hours, two days, two months, or two years. Never refactor until the end. All right? I'll tell you why. Because at the end of the day, you just want to make it work. I recommend this highly. All right? Um, and, and here's a reason for this. And you're going to hate it because it's bad code. You're going to say, Jim Jim's like, wait, it's terrible code. It's, it's cancer. It's AIDS. Right? You know, people say all these weird things nowadays. Right? Uh, yeah, it is. It's really bad. Right? However, huh? It's it's bad, yeah. And and the thing is, I can't repeat that. We're being recorded. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, right? Uh, it's really really bad, right? And uh, but it works. It's slow, but it works, right? I can always iterate and fix it and make it better, but I can't make it work if it's really good code that's incomplete, right? Same time, this is where I go down to: Is it good enough? That's why I'm bringing this topic up. Is it good enough? Because collisions, guys. We can go really deep into doing a simulation that's accurate, super accurate, but not going to ever be part of a game, right? Example, pixel perfect collision, right? I want to know exactly where on my ship, my plane or whatever, and which part of the bullet is striking my plane. Why? What's the point? And I'm saying people do that. They go, I want pixel perfect collision. It's accurate, super accurate. Yeah, but it's slow, right? And especially if I have thousands of bullets, it's going to be really, really slow, okay? Or particles or whatever. So this is the thing to do it. What is good enough? And the circle versus circle kind of collision detection is the first type I want to talk about, which is the most common type uh, when we first start off. We can extend this scenario to a sphere. So again, going back to our blender idea, right? And again, let's suppose I have some kind of weird, irregular object in blender, right? Um, what I want to do is, and this is not a, an irregular object, but let's suppose, um, you know, we make it so that it is irregular. Um, you know, we'll use, I don't know, some kind of, um, oh, sure. And we'll de detect, uh, cool. select some of these faces, make it irregular, right? That's what we said. And yeah, well, some weird thing like that. I don't know. I'm tired this morning, guys. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do random stuff. Okay. So now, and you know something weird. Okay. So we have some kind of weird shape like this, and we want to take collisions uh, on this thing. Um, you know, maybe we'll even push one of these things up here too. So <laughs> I like growling when it comes to this because it's like, ah. okay. And then yeah, and then we'll just push this in. You know to. Kind of something like that. So we have this really weird shape, and I want to take collisions in this shape. How do I do it? Put a sphere around it, right? Um, and the reason for that is, is it's just simple, right? I mean, you know, you can take a sphere and surround this thing as a, as, as its bounding box, right? And um, you have fairly accurate radius between this object and another object, or a capsule would be another good solution, all right? Capsule, especially if it's thin and, you know, that's why they use capsule colliders for players because they're thin and tall right um you know those kind of things it makes sense right it's a very primitive we use primitive objects to surround our objects that are more complex inside and then we get some kind of relatively good collision detection a good example is this is this okay you're making a first person shooter in unity or unreal right and you know do you really care like where the camera hits the other how can you tell exactly when you're being collided with when you're in a first person shooter scenario you can't Right. So if you collide, unless it's really weird, like it's really far away, like I, I I'm playing Fallout and lately I, I've noticed a bunch of glitches. Right. Tables that are supposed to be there are actually invisible. Yes. Right. I don't know if you noticed that. Right. Yes. 
like this things fly over. It's just a, it's a Fallout 76 glitch, right? Where it's like literally the table, there's like stuff that's floating in midair, right? And this is a AAA game, guys. So like, you know, that you pay $100 for or $79 or whatever it is. I think it's $69 now at Costco, by the way. Anyway, so, you know, so you're traveling down, you're going through this first person shooter and, and you're going towards this stuff and you see this like these floating items and you're like, wait, that's not right. Or floating rocks, wait, that's not right. What the hell is that? And of course, there's something that's there that's, there's a collider there, but it's in, the object is gone, right? Somehow it's like glitched out, right? So then, you know, you go towards the object and you're like, wait, I can't move forward anymore. Why? Because there's a collider there. Or if you ever travel on, a, on the edge of a map and it says, turn back, you know, something like that. And there's a collider there, right? You just, you can't see the collider, but it's stopping you from going forward. It's bad. It's ugly. It breaks the immersion, right? And um, so if it's something that breaks, breaks the immersion, like we're using a, we're going to use a sphere to surround this thing. And again, if I go back out to uh, object mode here, and if I use a sphere, um, you know, it's, let's use a, a UV sphere for a second. And let's suppose that this UV sphere um, is surrounding this thing. Like, think about, take a look at this, right? Even so, I mean, I have to make the sphere fairly large, right, for it to fully encompass the, that weird object that's inside, right? And this is a problem, right? Because there's parts of the sphere or parts of the circle that are unused, empty inside, right? So you have radius that's no good, right? And so we have other shapes like uh, cubes. A cube would be better in this case because it's kind of cube-like. Uh, a cube kind of collider that works. But let's talk about the sphere and circle first. So what I mean is, uh, this is okay, right? This this scenario works fine, right, with a sphere. But what if I have this object, <laughs> right? Again, I, I'm putting this out because this is part of the first the first part of our concepts. You know, when it comes to collision detection, what kind of collision detection am I going to use? How does this work? Okay, so I said that I'm going to draw a, a circle around this thing. Right, so, and you might think that this is a good scenario and it actually is better than a bounding box. We'll talk about the bounding box scenario later. Let's make the circle like the same size. So it encompasses the whole thing. So circles there, let's say, and maybe something like that. I don't know if I made that a perfect circle, but whatever. Um, so yeah, you have this scenario and it's this, this circle that's, that's encompassing this thing. So what about in here? What happens in here? So this is okay. But let's suppose I have this scenario, right, where I have my plane. Let's get rid of. Let's get move my bullet over here for a second because I want to keep that bullet. I have my plane, and I have the bounding box for my plane. Just I'm just going to group these together. Um, I've got my bounding box for my plane, and now I'm going to detect it. There's a logical collision here, yeah, because I said that if the radius of this thing and the radius of this thing right? If it's less than the distance, and it would be in this case, right? We have a collision. So now I have a scenario where I have a logical collision, but not a visual collision. Visually, we look at the scenario and we're like, ah, that's, that's not right. I'm going to collide there and it doesn't make any sense, right? And you can mitigate this by making the circle smaller, but then there's going to be areas of the, of the object that are not going to um, the collision, uh, collided, uh, collided with. Uh, you were going to say something? I could. Uh, I mean, it's sure, but I mean, what about if I have a complex object this way, right? And, you know, I, I my designer, my artist says, this is what I want you to, to collide with. Uh, programmer, go, right? What are you going to do? Try. Try, yeah. Uh, some people, what about, what about, uh, here's a scenario. Uh, how about if you, would you be okay with chopping this up and making multiple colliders? Is there a bad thing there? So now there's three times or two times the amount of, of collision detection per object, right? So I have like three colliders on this thing instead of two colliders, and I have like three times the amount of collisions. I'm saying just in the bare basic bones, guys. There's other ways of optimizing. We're not going to talk about it right now. I just want you to get the basic idea here, okay? You're making a collision detection system. And with our SDL templates, we're gonna do this stuff together in class, right? I want you to check it out, you know, see the difference, see if it's realistic and so on. All right, so yeah, I try and do this collision detection, but I'm really far away, right? By the way, it's a little better than the bounding box that we're gonna talk about in a bit. For example, I have the circle, yay, um, but what about, if I have a bounding box instead, and we're going to talk about different primitives, right? We talked about primitive shapes, uh, some kind of rectangular shape or a, a square shape. 
There's our bounding box. We're going to make it so that it, it encompasses, I'm going to use a different color here. It encompasses this, um, the cloud. And is this worse or is it better? What do you think? I'm just making it so that it's, it's worse or better. Why, why would you say it's worse? Let's just take a look at the difference between one or the other. All right, so here's our bounding box. Let's suppose you could do something like this. So it's not exactly a square, but it's a bounding box. So it actually bounds exactly where it is instead of a circle. And if let's suppose if you really want to optimize a circle, we don't use a circle, but actually an ellipse of some kind, right? So we can actually vary the radius on depending on width and height, let's just say, All right? Because we could do that. Um, not really common, but let's suppose. But here, uh, what's the better way of doing this? This is squarish, right? And this is circleish. And if you notice the circle collision, there's lots of space in here. But what about the square? Well, this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. Look at this. This whole thing is inside the square, but there's no collision, right? This is bad. There's a lot of areas here that can be bad, right? So why am I showing you this, uh, this thing? If your <laughs> objects, here's the rules, OK? And my, my rules. If your objects are squarish, use a square bounding box, right? If your objects are circle-ish, right? Use this, use some kind of circle. I'm not joking, right? Because if it's if it's squarish, the bounding box we're, we're going to talk about the bounding box algorithm is the simplest, uh, you know, algorithm you can use without using a square root. Okay. Once we get into circle-to-circle -circle detection, we start with a square root, but we can actually reduce this by using um, squared magnitude, which we'll talk about later, right? Where we don't have to do, we have to do squared distance. We we compare the squared distance with the squares of the of the radii, right? So it's almost like between before we do uh, Pythagorean theorem, a c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. We just leave it like that. We don't do the square root at all. We just square, right? So it's the same, right? If you keep it all the same, if I say it's a square of the distance, the square of the, sorry, the, the square of the distance is equal to the squares of the radii. Uh, you know, if they're less than those two things and no uh, square root. It's more efficient, actually, because square root is bad. And by the way, here's another question. From a calcula calculations perspective, do we want to use, whether you're using uh, JavaScript or Unity or whatever, some kind of math or math f or something dot square root, math dot pow, anything like that ever? And by the way, is math dot power, like the power function, is it any uh, better or worse than square root? What do you think? wrong it's exactly the same because i can go power to the, to the point 0.5 right which is a square root and it's exactly the same please don't use pow or or square root if possible use the object times the object you know x times x y times y z times z you know that's power to, 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 to you know use that much more uh also dividing still is less efficient than multiplying so if you're going to do dividing by two for whatever reason multiply by 0.5 Okay, it's different. It's a better algorithm uh, overall than dividing by two. It's very slightly better, but slight performance increases over uh, 60 frames per second with thousands of objects equates to better performance. Yes, you can bit shift as well. There's lots of things you can do uh, to avoid divide division. Okay, so I'm bringing these scenarios to you because this is the, the challenge we're going to have. We're, our challenge is what kind of collider do I, do I assign? How about those crazy mesh colliders in Unity? Oh, yeah. We got, like, mesh collider options. You know, we can use those all the time. Yeah. It does all kinds of weird stuff, that thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's you know, mesh colliders are really, really bad performance, right? And typically, we don't want to use those. We want to use primitive colliders first, all right, and see if the collision detection is good. And the other thing is this, right? One of the things we talked about... Um, is finding the fun in your game, right? If, you, if your game is fun and it's the collision is good enough by you doing play testing, leave it, <laughs> okay? Don't be uh, do something for completeness, quote unquote, and go, well, for completeness, I want to make my, I'm going to use separating access theorem because I think that's the better way of doing things. And it's more accurate. Who cares if it's more accurate? Does it look good? Does it perform? Does it, is it fun? Is it playable? Leave it. Move on, all right? Um, and don't optimize as you go, right? I like your thinking to optimize as you go because at the end of the day, you're thinking, and by the way, if you're talking about from a service perspective, we always say, do it right the first time. We're programmers, and furthermore, let's cut it down. We're not just programmers and developers. We're game devs, right? Game devs, 
don't optimize until the end. If you optimize right at the beginning, you'll waste your time because we're going to pivot. We're going to change our ideas. We're going to modify stuff. We're going to, you know, create classes, destroy classes, do all kinds of stuff. And in a rough way, we're going to almost like scattergun approach to figure out how things are done. I'm sorry to say it, but almost like, uh, what is it? Uh, spray and pray kind of programming, right? I'm um, sorry, but that's what we do. And then finally, somehow we have some a product, right? And it's amazing that we even have a product at the end. Oh my God, we have a game? Did we make a game? How do we do that, right? Somehow. And it's kind of cool too. It's kind of fun, right? So whatever I'm saying is whatever you do, uh, you know, I mean, your philosophy is your own. This is how I operate. I don't, I don't optimize until after, right? Optimization is really good and it's great. And if you can do it, if you already have uh, some toolbox, this is one thing I have to, I have to also add an addendum to this thing, uh, which is, yeah, okay. If you have something that's already optimized, that's good, right? So I've, I've done a game before and I have an optimized algorithm that I'm going to inject into my new game because I have it already. I've already written, written it and there's no work to be done. Hear that proviso? No work, right? Good, do it. Because just cut, paste, and make it work, right? But if, um, you know, as an example, I, don't, I had a friend of mine who was working on a uh, shooter and he already had really cool 3D camera controls, right, set up, right? So he didn't have to set any of that stuff up again anymore because he just like literally transplanted his camera controls from one game to the other. Fantastic. He worked hard on those camera controls. He optimized them in the other game and included them in this game. Great. But if, if he said, if I said like, I just need player movement and he went to these complicated camera controls, the player movement would never happen in the time that we had. You have an hour, you know, as an example, do your stuff. Here's a game jam. You have a, over a weekend. Yeah. Now, what does it take like two years to like make sequels for a game? Like say like FIFA or like Call of Duty. Why does it take two years? Okay. How many people are in this class? There's like 70 people maybe, not even anymore. Oh. Not today, right? <laughs> but let's suppose there's supposed to be 70 people in the class. So imagine I take all 70 of you today as an exercise and say, we're making a game now. In the next hour, I want you to produce a game. You know, one of those kinds, like almost like the radio voice I'm gonna use, right? And then, yeah, and do it. Guys, get together and I want you just to make any game that has some kind of collision detection and I give you some kind of you know requirements and I want you to make it. Now, go, right? And everyone has to be engaged. That is the answer. Right. So I want you to use everybody in the class. No one can be idle. Right. By the way, no one can be idle in a game studio. If you're idle, you've got like dead weight money that's being out going out the window every single week. Right. So everyone has to be active. And then you're like, OK, so how do I marshal that? How do I do that? What's the right size for my game? How many developers? How many artists? How many this? How many that? That's the challenge. Right. And also. Studios, they you know they they have a big process. There's the pre-production phase that we that we learned about in uh, in uh, game production, and they start off with uh, their building and their you know the mechanics, the idea. They ideate a lot. They sit there and you know kind of figure it out. So in the beginning, they're trying to figure out what's cool to make, and what's fun to make, and what's really popular and hot in the marketplace. That's another thing nowadays. Um, is it going to be hot enough in a year or two years? Is it? Who knows, right? Like, is Fortnite going to be popular two years from now? In its current form, maybe not. Maybe it's gonna be gone in its current form. It won't even exist. You know, will Fortnite save the world be even a thing? You know, a year from now, don't know, right? Um, you know, that's the problem with game dev studios. They, you know, they they want to do things as fast as possible, but there's a lot of stuff to do. Artwork takes a hell of a long time to do, right? Even if you have a lot of artists, you know, making an organic character uh, model in some kind of program like ZBrush, uh, you know, or something like that, just to make one model. Uh, might take you three months, right? You know, one really good model that's rigged, and uh, I'm talking 3D, uh, and animated mocap, motion capture for that one model might take, you might have 30 to 40 different, um, you know, uh, motion rigs just for that one model, right? That one character, right? So it, like, there's a lot of work to be done, and it takes a lot of money. That's why they cost, games now cost, like the AAA games, $150 million, you know, crazy, crazy amount of money, um, and it takes a long time. There's play testing. There's also regulations that they have to go through. They have to make sure that their game is is going to work in Australia and in Japan and in the United States and whatever. Uh, there's marketing involved. There's pre-marketing. There's play testing. There's beta testing. There's tons. It's a huge engine of stuff. And guess what? We're always in crunch time. There is no non-crunch time in game dev. Yeah. But it still yeah. Bit, like frustrates me when I see the budget for the AAA game, right? Yeah. And they spend more on the marketing rather than development. Well, because, you know, um, what do they say about marketing, right? 
Um, any publicity is good publicity. Hello, Trump, right? Any publicity is good publicity, right? Because it's like, you know, at least you know the person. The, if you know the product, the idea of marketing is if 100% of people know my product across the world, I'm great. I'm fantastic, even if they hate it because they know my product. They know me. If they know me, that means that's great. I have a lot of influence. It means anything I produce, people know about. Imagine that. Everybody in the entire world, right? Especially if it's a little bit positive, right? <laughs> that's good, right? So, um, so yeah, the marketing is really important because they get it out there. They create hype. They just like if you would watch a trailer on. Uh, they get the best parts. The trailer, just producing the trailer and cinematics. Uh, there's a whole aspect there that they try and drag you into the game ahead of time, um, and get you excited. Especially if it's a franchise that's been done before. Um, example: Fallout 76, which I have to say at this point I'm a little disappointed in, uh, since I've been playing it. Anyways, we digress. So what what I'm what I'm saying is. What is good enough? That's what I'm going to talk about. Because if we don't talk about what's good enough, we're going to get going to this rabbit hole that's going to say, I want pixel perfect simulation quality, you know, collisions. Now, that might be okay if you're doing a physics simulation, a scientific simulation, where you're trying to simulate exactly, exactly. You need to get results. There's going to be a log of where your movement, your, your object is moving, and so on. I think these are good things for that. Um, and then you can't be satisfied with the, what is good enough. It's not a game anymore. It's a serious game. A game for pleasure and a serious game are totally different. And if you have a serious game, a game that's used for simulations uh, or teaching somebody something, uh, then uh, then maybe what's good enough, you have to go to take it to the next level, OK? All right, so that's the narrow phase stuff. Um, so we talked about this idea of primitives. So in 3D or in 2D, you have this idea where we would encapsulate the complex object within a, an, a primitive. But there, we also talked about how this can be bad. So here's, again, exa again this, we have this object in 3D. We have an asymmetrical object, something that doesn't really quite fit a sphere or a cube. And we have some wasted space, right? And that wasted space is going to be, is going to create the idea of no visual collision but logical collision. Uh, logically, I have a collision in my code, but visually doesn't seem like there's a collision at all, right? Which can be weird. Uh, user, the user experience and immersion is going to go down, right? Uh, and so that you have to create this balance of the idea. Um, and so we talked about this idea of the radius. I just kind of did it more in a visual format, but here it is in your PowerPoint slides, excuse me, where you have the radius of the object and the distance. If the distance uh, is less than the two radii combined, you have a collision between two spheres or two circles. And by the way, guys, this is the first thing we're gonna be checking. If anything, I will put this on an assignment or some kind of exercise where you do this simple collision. Because this is, again, the most popular, easy to do thing uh, uh, you know, that we know, okay? Pseudocode. Um, this is some pseudocode for how this could work. Uh, we. And by the way, uh, don't worry about the code here. This could apply to any scenario, whether I'm using JavaScript, which looks like what this is, or the, whether we use C++ or Java or C Sharp or whatever language you like, uh, processing, whatever, right? Uh, Python. You know, you have two circles are, are defined with a radius of 20 and 12 and X and Y coordinates in a, a specific location. Um, we're going to try and do this in class later on today, if we can, in lab. And uh, we have some kind of speed, right? Where the, you know, the, or sorry, the uh, change in X is, you know, the difference between circle, uh, circle one and circle two, as an example. And then we get to this funky, ugly function right here, math.square root. And like I said to you, this is the worst form. Luckily, they did this. Look at the, they didn't do math.square root and math.pow. That would be like the, doing math square root twice, right? Or three times. Um, yeah, so what I would do is I wouldn't do square root at all. I would just say, so take the, uh, you know, the square, the squares of, uh, the, the difference in X's and the squares and the different in Y's. And I would do that and then take the square of the distance squares, not the, not the square root and compare those. They're all comparable because you don't have to do a square root then, right? If you take your distance and then you square it, you're good, right? Cause then you're just comparing squares to squares as opposed to, but it's going to be a weird number. Like if the distance is actually 10 pixels, you're going to get like 100 pixels. So if it's 100, 
but then you're not going to you're not going to square with the other ones either. So it's going to be within reason. So it's going to you're going to compare one number to another number, and it's going to make sense. That's what I'm saying, right? And then no square root. Um, so this is the formula, right? So if you got the situation, if the distance is less than a circle radius plus circle radius two, yeah, you've got a collision detection. This is the simplest form. Okay, any questions around this formula? I know I've talked it to death, but guys forget this and they do other things. And then they're like, but well, why? Why are you doing anything more than this? This is mostly good enough for 2D, right? All right. Um, so also the things that we have to talk about is what about a horizontal or vertical surface, right? And again, if the distance from the center of the circle to the surface is less than or equal to the radius of, this, of, the, uh, of the circle, then a collision has occurred, okay? So the distance from the center of the circle to the surface. How do you do that? How do you de define the surface? What surface? So example, what I mean by this is, this is easy, but what about if you have a situation like this, right? So let's just not, we're not using planes anymore, okay? Uh, no planes, no islands or you know, crazy stuff. I want my ocean back, all right? But let's say you have a scenario where, I'll leave my bullet, and I have some kind of you know, uh, platformer, right? As a platformer. And let's suppose I have a, my uh, character. I don't have a character. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And my character is going to be a, a triangle tube, a rectangle tube. There we go. Here's my character, and we'll make him different. We'll make him green. Sure. Let's make it green. Yeah, green. There's my character, and just representing this thing. So I have my character running along, and, he, and he's bouncing along here, and he jumps. It's here, and da da. How do I do the, the, the detection algorithm here? What's the difference? So, I mean, I could use uh, bounding box collisions because I have two bounding boxes and they're going to intersect. This is, makes sense because they're squarish. Remember, I said squarish is bounding boxes, circle issues, something. What about if I have this scenario? I have a circleish kind of character, or even it's a circle, like a, some kind of bullet, and I want to see if it collides with this situation. And especially if it's uh, differently sized. So, I have a situation where if I use the circle here, right? And I use a circle here, it's going to be really weird. It's going to be visually unappealing. And so, I mean, I could put a square around this thing. I could do that too and make the, this little uh, object a square. Uh, but, you know, the, the challenge I'm going to have is I'm going to have some weird thing because if I look at the circle and if I try and detect the, the distance between the centers, so here's my distance between the centers. There now, there's my distance. But meanwhile, my bounding box like, is weird because this rectangle is long. And I have, um, you know, a difference between the width and the height, a great distance between the width and the height, especially if it's very narrow. So a good example of that would be if this is very, very narrow, like something that looks like this, right? And then, you know, how do I detect that? Or even if it's more narrow, like it's like a line, what do I do? What's the scenario here, huh? I could detect to a point. Again, there's different scenarios where I, where I do that. Um, and... Uh, how about I want to detect the contact point? I want to know where exactly I collided. Do I have to use, do I have to use um, pixel perfect collision? Is it, do I still have to do that? What do you think? Yes. Okay. So this point here. Okay. So what are the distance between the point to the center of the circle? You mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I can tell that's the radius. That's the first thing I want to do, the radius from the, the circle. But what about, how do I know? Do I check, which one do I use to check? Do I use the this to check? Is this checking or is this checking? The closest point on the, the bounding of the rectangle. The closest point, which is here, let's say, right? Okay, how do I know that? How do, what's, what's the algorithm? Uh, you have to check uh, the mean length of the, the circle first, and you have to, whether the, and you can have, you should check the center of the radius. I mean, I can write down the code. Okay, okay. So again, what I would do in this scenario, but if I have a platformer type scenario with lots of longer platforms like this, I may consider switching from circle detection to bounding box because it's more, there's more objects that are squarish than circleish. All right? Because bounding box collisions are known. Those are actually quite easy to do. Right, uh, like especially aligned bounding boxes like this. These are all boxes in the same alignment. They're on the same axis. They're notice they're not rotated in some way, right? Once we have a rotated bounding box, like we have this this shape here, 
the bounding box is like this, right? But what if, you know, and I'm just gonna point this out to you, what if the bounding box, what if this thing is like this, right? Where's the bounding box now, right? You can't do a bounding box like this. Computers don't do that. The bounding box is like this, right? Where the points are, right? So the actual bounding box might look something like, I'm just gonna take a, oops. A bounding box might look something different than what it actually looks like physically. So this is what it physically looks like in the bounding box. I know, go guys, and this is academic, okay? Don't, I'm not expecting you guys to be wowed by this or uh, somehow figure this out as, oh my God, it's a revelation that Tom is talking about here. No, we're just talking about scenarios because you're gonna get, you're gonna come to these scenarios again and again. And on your test, I'll ask you different things. I'll say things like, so, you know, make this happen, make the collisions work. What are you gonna use? And, you know, so yeah, so this is the new bounding box. If I rotate my object, this is not an axis line bounding box anymore, right? If I use this bounding box, there's a lot of inefficiencies again. We have the scenario where I can fit a whole object inside the bounding box and no collision, right? So in this scenario, using a bounding box might be weird or I have to use a different, different algorithm, right? But if in the scenario that everything is aligned, oops, when the scenario with everything is aligned, where we don't have this situation, right? And this is actually looking more like how it used to, right? It's aligned. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah, there it is. Somewhat. Uh, if it's somewhat aligned like this, then it doesn't matter. Use a, use a regular bounding box if it's aligned, okay? And this is where we get into the next part, which is um, the idea that we can also use other shapes like a vertical cylinder, right? A vertical cylinder for a 3D geometry is pretty good too, right? Because again, it can encapsulate longer objects, taller objects or wider objects. And a cylinder is just a bunch of circles, right? Along a, uh, a distance, right? So the difference between a cylinder, actually, if anything, that is one of the easiest shapes to figure out because we don't care about the top of the cylinder or the bottom of the cylinder. So think about the cylinder as the beginnings of a capsule, right? If I want to make a capsule in Blender, as an example, um, I'm going back to Blender. Here's our capsule. Uh, and let's suppose I want to make a cap in Blender. There is no, uh, by the way, there's no capsule object typically, all right? In Blender, uh, we can make a cylinder. Here's a cylinder. And the top and bottom of the cylinder are flat, right? Um, and the question is, do you really care about the top and the bottom anyway, for the most part? If I surround an object with a, with a, with a cylinder like this, I have a radius and I have a height, right? And depending on um, you know, where I'm checking, I have a primitive object that I can, that with a known uh, shape that I can check. Remember going back to primitives. This is not a bad scenario for, uh, for, for several things, right? Where I can check radius as well as length. There's two things I can check, right? And, uh, and this, this scenario can help us uh, determine things in 2D and 3D, all right? So this idea of um, whether an object collides with a cylinder, uh, you know, the circular criteria apply, but only over the vertical length of the cylinder, right? And then if the distance x, y plane uh, of the cylinder, the surface of another object is less than or equal to the radius of the cylinder, then a collision has occurred. And, and this is cool because you can use both the uh, width scenario as well as the, you know, cylindrical shape. Okay, so it's almost like using a bounding box and a circle at the same time, kind of. All right. Um, so, and I'm not gonna you know, talk about too much about this. I wanna go into this next part, which is, um, this is methods of creating it. Um, I want to go into not just collision fears, but talk about bounding boxes. There's two types that we normally talk about. We talked about something called an axis line bounding box, and there's another type called uh, an object aligned bounding box, right? So axis line bounding box is when everything is like squared on an axis. Object line bounding box is when I have this scenario where something is rotated and now I'm using the uh, objects, uh, the alignment of the objects to compare uh, my collisions. So again, an axis line bounding box is easy because it's like literally it's axis line with world space uh, coordinate systems. So X and Y, the bounding box is perfectly straight and narrow, right? There's no problem. Uh, this is a, the best case scenario in terms of our um, you know, kind of determining a collision. And here's an example of some code 
that could help us with the bounding box. What we want to do is we want to check the minimum and maximum, just like when you said, right? So we have our two rects, our rectangles. We have X and Y coordinates and a width and a height of these two rectangles. And what we want to have is I want to check if my <coughs> rectangle one dot X, which is the location, uh, is less than rectangle two dot X, is it? So let's see. Is uh, rectangle one less than rectangle two dot X? Yeah, the first check is passed. Plus rectangle two dot width, these two things. So rectangle two dot X, which is 20, plus rectangle two dot width, which is 10, so it's 30. So we're saying is five less than 30? Yes, so check, we have a check there. Okay, next. So we can determine if this is colliding. Um, okay, the next one is rectangle one dot X plus rectangle one dot width. So X five width is 50, that's 55, is greater than rectangle two dot X, rectangle two dot X. So is 50 greater than 20 or 55 greater than 20? Yes, so check. Two, two things of checked so far. Let's take the next one. Okay, rectangle one dot Y and is less than rectangle two dot Y plus rectangle two dot height. So rectangle one dot Y, so is five is less than rectangle two dot y, right? And we can see that it's true anyway. I don't have to go further, right? So check, right? And then let's say the last one, rectangle one dot height plus rectangle one dot, uh, dot y, right? So rectangle one dot height. So rectangle one is 50 plus rectangle one dot y, 55, is greater than rectangle two dot y. Check, all four checked, we have a collision. So what you're doing is you're checking the top left boundary, the top right boundary, the bottom right, and the bottom left. And if those two triangles intersect anywhere in there, uh, or rectangles, I mean, then you're good. And that's what the, that's what's happened here. That's what they, that's related. To. So this is again some pseudocode, but this axis line bounding box idea is the easiest way to detect collisions. But again, it's only for squarish, rectangular-ish objects. Once you start using something that's really weird or irregular, you're going to have, uh, you know, a reduced user experience, or you're going to have a break in immersion. It's just not going to work because it's going to look weird. Okay. Next type. So we have this one, and again in 3D, we can still use um, we can use rectangular prisms, as similar to what we've done, which we just shown you, except you have an extra coordinate as well. You have X, Y, and Z. Uh, it's still the pretty most the most common way of doing things. And a bounding box again is the least uh, uh, in terms of overall calculations, right? Again, depending on the scenario, right? Now we have this situation. Um, sometimes we have objects where we want to um, be more accurate, let's say, and or you have objects that are not aligned. Uh, correctly. In this case, they're all, we can still use AABB collisions, but the problem is you have scenarios where, um, you know, you have an area of the bounding box that has nothing inside of it, and you have a visual, no visual collision, but actually you have logical collisions. Separating ASCII theorem can help us reduce that by using a different methodology in order for us to detect collisions. But now you can see that separating ASCII theorem actually does six different checks for objects, right? And so what it, the idea is that we have an access, if we can have any access that separates, uh, as an example, any one of the, the uh, bounding areas. So if I can put it, if I can draw a plane or a, or a line between any of the two axes, right? Whether it's a diagonal axis, a vertical or horizontal axis, anything like that, then I don't have a collision. Okay, that's what it is. However, if I can't, if I, if I, if something like this, then you do have a collision and it only has to happen on one axis. This is the thing with, uh, with axis aligned or a separating axis theorem. Okay. Does everyone understand that? So if I can draw a plane in 3d space, if I can draw a plane that divides two objects and there's something between them, if I can put something between them, there's no collision, right? That's the idea behind it. Um, but how do you calculate this? Well, the idea is that um, really to see if there's some kind of gap between the two objects. And what we can do is we can project the two objects down onto an axis. So I take an object like a square and I project it down uh, onto this x-axis. And I take these, these objects and project it down to the y-axis. 
And when I do that, this is just something in 2D. Let's take a look at this as an example. So I have this in 2D, right? Where I have, uh, I'm projecting this stuff down over here on the Y axis and this over here on the X axis. Notice on the Y axis, you have overlap. So the actual projection on the Y axis that we're, when I say projection, I actually take the objects and like literally draw lines and you have a min and maximum value that happens on the, on the Y axis or on the X axis. On the X axis, there's a gap. There's no collision on the X axis in this case, but here there's no gap, right? So here the separating axis theorem would say check. That means you might have a collision, but here is the same thing, right? It's the same two objects. Here we have a gap, so there's no collision, right? So both scenarios must be true. There must be no gap in both scenarios in order for you to have a collision. Both must check off as true. This is a little bit more accurate, but you're gonna notice the code is a little bit more intense. And so separating axis theorem, again, I don't recommend unless you have a very complex scenario, right? because it becomes more challenging in terms of, uh, from a programming perspective. And I'm just like, uh, I'm not going to, going to go too much in here. I'm just gonna explain it instead of read it. Um, and there's some scenarios that, um, uh, there's a bunch of angles to check. So here's an example where um, if I want to, uh, how do I make that work? So step one, I take one side from the polygon I'm testing and find the normal. Okay, so this is my thing. So I've got my own normal uh, from the polygon, right? And this will be the axis I want to check. Okay, so I want to check that axis. And the next step two, right? I want to, um, you know, loop through each of the point on the first polygon and project it onto an uh, onto this axis, right? The, the normal, equivalent to the normal that I just made, all right? So I take this, so this is just the normal. If you look look here, this is the normal. This axis is gonna be a parallel to this, this object here, right? And we're gonna go through each of the points and project them down to this. So now we have a, we've got a projection onto this axis. Cool, so that's, that's step two. Step three, we're gonna do the same thing for the second polygon, whatever that is. So we're projecting down to this, the same axis, right? And then step four, is there a gap? If there's no gap, right, uh, then we might have a collision. That's the first, the first check we're doing. By the way, we're gonna do this for every axis, right? And, and we're gonna keep doing it, um, you know, but the problem is that, um, you know, we're gonna have some problems. And the pros are, if you're gonna look at this thing, it's fairly fast because you, we've, we've actually solved this thing. The algorithm is known. It's not like someone, has, you guys have to figure it out. I mean, you can download a version of separating axis theorem and install it in your game, no problem, and utilize it. On the bad side, convex polygons, that's not good. So what does that mean? So if I have a polygon that looks weird, like I don't have a, a polygon that's uh, concave, uh, you know, something weird. So let's use a diagram, I guess. So so what if I have a polygon, um, let's see, just some lines. Uh, the, you know, this is if this is my polygon, uh, polygon it's okay. It's just a, uh, a triangle. But what if I have a polygon that looks like this? And what, what do I do then, right? I'm just saying, like that's kind of a weird shape, right? But we can get that. But sometimes you have a real, really weird shape like that. So how do I, how do I use that that theorem? How do I separate the axis in that theorem? It's hard. So that's where where the theorem breaks down. Yeah, I know. Well, more checks. Well, every time I every time I redo, I cut it or I add more collision checking. There's more checking, more checking, more computationally expensive, right? So that's the that's the challenge, right? Um, so here's a, a, a specific scenario where we have a bunch of little dots, right? As an example, so this is dot one one, dot one two, dot one three, dot one four, and dot one zero. We have two boxes, box one and box two. And what we want to do is detect if any of the boxes <coughs> collide, right? As an example. Um, so again, here's your SAT code, right? And the SAT code looks like this. I have uh, an axis, which is some kind of vector two ED object, right? And it says, uh, in this particular case, this vector 2D object has something called the unit vector, right? Okay, so it's actually normalized. That's what this is saying, right? So we have a one and minus one. That's our new vector 2D, that's the axis, okay? And then we have box one, right? Um, which is of type vector, a vector 2D, let's suppose. And again, this is just pseudocode, right? So we've made three different, uh, uh, vectors, right, for different boxes. 
right? Box one, box two, and the axis that we're looking at. And then this is, by the way, for each of the axes, right? For each axis on the box, right? Uh, and then what we want to say is for the corner of box one, all right, which is of type point, right? That's what the, the, the type is, the point. Uh, we're going to say that, um, you know, get the dot somehow. We don't have an algorithm for this, but we want to get the dot for that point. So the, the corner of box one. And then we're also going to do the same thing with, uh, you know, box two, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to um, all the vectors, and this is something I uh, didn't see, but this is actually a vector of, of uh, points, right? We're going to push this particular uh, uh, point onto that vector, okay? And... Once we've gone that, we and you can see the, the algorithm is way more complex. Once we have a, an array, if you will, of points uh, for all the for each of the boxes, uh, then we're going to take the dot product, right, uh, to cap calculate the min and maximum projection of the box, right. And once we've done that, we're going to loop through uh, each of the minimum and maximums uh, of the projections for each of the boxes, and we're going to determine whether the what we're going to get for the minimum dot on box one and the maximum dot uh, for box uh, box one, min and maximum dots. And once we've done that, we can start doing detection. To me, guys, this is a lot of work. Um, you know, it, for you to have for you to check if an object is separated or not. Right? Is it accurate? Yep. It's way more accurate to do this than uh, axis aligned bounding box or object aligned bounding box. Way more accurate, but way more complex. And we're going to be show, I'm gonna, we're going to be going through this a lot more in class when we try some of this stuff out to make it work. Okay. There's also some other scenarios that I'm going to handle. For example, um, at, starting next week, we're going to start talking about weird scenarios like line and, and circle, line and box. You know point and circle, point and box. There's different scenarios we can set up. We can detect different things and it's gonna help us uh, to be more accurate when it comes to detection, especially when it comes to lines. Like I wanna check uh, you know, how far an object is moving or uh, if an object is collided with another object in 2D or 3D space, we can use different uh, scenarios. Am I not charging? I'm not charging. I plugged it in, but I did not plug it into my machine. Yay! Um, yeah, that would have been bad. Imagine that I'm project I'm, I'm, I'm broadcasting and also poof, I'm off the air, right? Who cares? And that's it. That's really what I want to talk about today. I don't want to talk about too much more. It's really the theory behind it. When we think about, we want to start thinking about stuff and I've, I've talked about a couple of scenarios. So there's three collision detection algorithms we talked about today, which are circle, axis line bounding box or object line bounding box and separating axis theorem, right? Circle detection easiest, and we get, and actually, I would say even easier with that, with less comp computationally expensive code, is the bounding box scenario. If you can, if it fits, if it's square-ish, rectangular-ish, right? If it's not, use circles. And sometimes, we can use hybrids, a hybrid detection method where I have both. And sometimes it's still less uh, less work than using separating axis there. Still less work. Okay. And sometimes what we do is we break a character down into several parts. Right. For example, if I have a character that has arms and legs, and they're moving and, and they have some kind of animation, uh, did we talk about the difference between animation and locomotion? I think we did. Yeah. Right. So we have an object that is, you know, uh, animating inside of a container. Right. It's moving, so there's locomotion for the object. But inside of the container, you have a person that's uh, or a character that's moving, and you want to detect if that character's arms or legs are going to hit an object. How do you do that? Then you maybe one scenario is create different bounding boxes for the arms and the legs, right? Or the head and the arms and the legs, right? Um, especially when it comes to platformers. Platformers are, you know, more difficult to do in general than almost any other kind of scenario, right? Doesn't matter whether you're 2D or 3D. A good example is this: I make I want to make a Mario clone, right? Uh, which everybody in their any game dev with their salt has made at some point in their life, right? I make a Mario clone. Cool. I get some, you know, uh, assets from Mario, and I'm going to make it, and I want to make good, solid collisions, right? And so what kind of collision detection did you guys use when you did that? Did you guys do that yet? Mario clone? 
Yes? Crazy man. You're a crazy man. Access the line bounty boxes for everything. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any other solutions? Unity's bounty boxes. Yes. Okay. Of course. Because you don't want to think about it. It's already done. What about Amar? Did you do anything with that? Did you do any kind of platforming? What did you do? So you just use Unity's. Um, so what do you do with platforms and how do you resolve that? Even in Unity, um, if I want to jump, you have to detect if the, if the character is physically touching the bounding box, right? I mean, if he's on the bounding box and he's walking along the bounding box, right? Um, he's colliding, constantly colliding with the bounding box, right? So he's not going to fall through the bounding box of the, of the platform he's on. And then, but when, then when he jumps, right, as an example, he's not in contact with that bounding box anymore, right? So you almost have this idea of, is the character grounded and is the character not grounded? This idea between the two states, right? So if the character is grounded, then he's not jumping, right? And if he's not jumping, don't play that jumping animation. But if you, he's not grounded, then play the jumping or falling animation, whatever. Maybe it's both. It's same, maybe it's one is the same thing. Maybe jumping and falling looks the same, you know? Um, but play that animation, right? And what about if the player jumps and connects with another platform, and this is a scenario that uh, people run into too. You have this scenario where your character is fairly squarish on a platform that's very thin. But what about, let's just get rid of this thing, whatever the heck this is that I drew. Uh, but let's suppose that instead of this scenario, you have a platform that looks like this, right? And let's make this red too. Why not? Red. No, that's not what I wanted. I wanted the inside to be red. Inside red. <coughs> Red, here's my red platform. And uh, what happens is this is a block like this, let's say, here's the, my character. And my character is here and he jumps. Does he connect with the platform? Yes, so then he just sticks, right? Is, am, I, am I connecting? Yes, I am, I'm, I've, con I've, con I've contacted. So how do I know where I'm connecting? If I'm here or if I'm here, how do I know? Like when I did it, I had a special bounding box just for this. See? So you broke your character down into two bounding boxes. You did one of these where you kind of said, well, I have a bounding box for this part and I have a bounding box for the rest of the parts, right? Maybe the bounding box at the bottom is going to be a sphere or a circle, right? If you can, if you can combine them, you're going to have a small contact area on the, on the, on the object anyway, right? So ray cast down, but ray casts are computationally expensive sometimes, right? Depending on how things are done, right? I'm just saying. I mean, you gotta, you gotta think about what the, what the best scenario is, right? So again, if I have this scenario, then am I connecting, right? Well, yes I am. This bounding box is connecting with this one. So how are you gonna do the bounding box to the feet? I'm talking programmatically, not, not, not Unity. Huh? I can make it smaller. I could make it smaller. And that's why a uh, circle works best. You know, sometimes, sometimes a circle works best. That's less than the size of the body, right? So the body can connect this way, um, but, um, you know, let's just uh, undo that change. But uh, yeah, but this you could make smaller. You could do something that looks like this maybe. Uh, no, that's wrong one, wrong tool. You could do something that looks like this. We're just talking because guys, you're gonna have to do uh, something like this uh, in lab where I ask you to do something in lab. And so, so if I make it smaller, uh, maybe even smaller just to make, make my point not really re realistic, but you know, so let's say this, the person's feet are like this. So kind of in the middle somehow, uh, I don't know. Okay. So in this scenario, if he's touching, um, okay, one more time, I'll make it there. He's really small, uh, really drastic. Okay. So he, this is his feet. So if he touches there on the floor then we're good. Right. And, but if he connects with this, this stuff, uh, you know, is he is he colliding? Yes, he is, but he's not standing, right? So therefore, um, you know, he's going to fall, right? And he's going to collide with that, as an example, or actually, that because he's on the sphere, right? So, um, so definitely a good scenario. But now, for the character, the player character, you're actually checking two different collisions for every frame, right? So twice as many collision detection for this for this character, right? Um, and again, the question I go, I, I, I'm asking you is, what do you want to collide, to check? Do you want to check with the um, the, coll the collider with the actual platform? Is the platform smart or is the character collider smart? Which one, right? 
because if the platform collides, it's going to check with any other character that's in play, right? Character or a enemy. Maybe there's only a few enemies in one, one player, but the player has many, many platforms to check with. So there's many more checks. And so sometimes I always think that it's better to make the platform smart and, and the character dumb, right? The characters colliders are just there for the platforms to check, not the character to check the platforms, right? Because it's just the shape of the, of the, uh, uh, of the character. So again, uh, these, this is food for thought for you guys, right? When it comes to doing this kind of work, when we start, we, when we uh, talk about, uh, you know, assignment three, we're going to be, I'm going to propose these kind of scenarios for you, right? I'm going to say, okay, this is a scenario. You have Mario or you have, you know, this kind of scenario. What kind of um, collision detection are you going to use? And show me the code, work it out. I want to see, I want to see what you're going to do here, right? In this particular case. And so this is the kind of stuff I'm going to ask you to do in assignment. Chances are, all right? We're going to program it out and test it. Test your code and give me a screenshot or do a little movie or something like that. I might give you guys to do a little, uh, you know, YouTube movie for like five minutes. Show me your stuff. Show me how your code works, right? Because, uh, yeah, 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 I will. Yeah, yeah. You're saying, no, don't do it. It's not so bad. Five minutes is not going to kill you, right? Um, and then that way I can see what you're doing. I know. Don't worry. Don't kill yourself yet. Um, any questions around this? Any comments about just basic collision detection we talked about today? All right. All right. So again, this this week's labs, uh, we're going to be doing more SDL work. I'm going to present a new template for you guys. The new template is going to have a game object superclass that we're going to make, and we're also going to have a texture class. I'm going to show you how to draw stuff with SDL this week. I got to do that, and then we're going to do some simple uh, scenarios in class where we create a player and an enemy. All right. So I want a player and an enemy. They're both going to inherit from. Uh, the game object superclass. That's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to be sharing that code with you in Blackboard uh, after this class. Okay. Otherwise, guys, I will see you from a lecture perspective next week, where we're going to talk more details about other kinds of detection methods.